Hi, Mike. Hey, James, good to see you. Great to see you. Nice place. Well, thank you for being here. It reminds me of my primary school. I'm, <laughs> I don't even want to go there. <laughs> So began our six days on the road with Australia's six billion dollar man. The casinos have changed a bit since the old days, haven't they? They certainly have. <laughs> James Douglas Packer. It's fun, isn't it? It's yeah. fun, it's exciting. He's fit, he's trim, and a little nervous. It's a bit intimidating with you guys here yeah, talking. It's... Don't worry, I'll be nice in editing. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm a big boy. Oh, One whistle stop week of filming. Double we'll check the shots. Mike, welcome to Crown the Cow. Thanks, mate. I have a long history with the Packers. I was first employed by his grandfather. Frank Packer sacked me. Kerry re employed me. Uh, number 889, Charlie Kapara, my 26. James is now the third in the Packer dynasty, his own man. But who is he really? Thanks, mate. Pleasure. You grew up under a very big shadow. Kerry Packer was larger than life. He was strong, he was tough, sometimes arrogant, sometimes very charming, clever, but a big man. What was it like to be his son? I think it was a huge privilege to be his son. I've had an incredibly fortunate life and my father was an amazing man and no person is perfect and no father-son relationship is perfect but when I think um, how many people I'd swap places with there aren't many and when I think how many people would swap places with me there's a lot so I think it's incumbent on, on me to remember how lucky I am and how fortunate I've been. The luck's easy to understand but was it tough from time to time? I always knew, even when Dad was being difficult, that at his core, he was a good person, and at his core, he loved me. One of the great joys in your life as a father, to do something with your son. Have you, you and your dad worked out who's the better player? Do you know who, um, who's the better player? Oh, I can't player say that on television. No? No way. <laughs> <laughs> you don't think you'd, uh, well, you can, you can say that if you want to. Uh, okay, he's definitely a better player. <laughs> he's fairly famous for his temper, also. Yeah, he had a good temper. He had he um, he was uh, he was best in class that I've come across at temper. <laughs> Tell you how I'm feeling. Leave me alone. Get out of my way. He could be terrifying. He, he was he was a larger than life character. He terrified you. Well, at, at times, absolutely. If he wanted to, he, if he wanted to, he pretty easily could terrify me. I believe in discipline. Yes, very much so. I uh, I believe that uh, that my father was fairly strict, but. Uh, I don't remember ever getting a belting I didn't deserve, and I can remember a few occasions I didn't get one and I did deserve them. So I don't believe he was ever unfair with me. He said, I believe in corporal punishment. And I thought, whoa, what does that mean for James? Yeah. <laughs> he, uh, he, he gave me, the, uh, he gave me the, uh, the, the belt only a couple of times. And I think, you know, a bit like, you know, he said with his dad, I do know that when it happened, I wasn't feeling as though I was an innocent victim. You know, I'd been caught red-handed doing something that he, you know, specifically told me not to do. But, um, you know, I, I wouldn't want to give you the impression that Dad was excessive in, in those things. I think, you know, he was... I, I, and I think times change. I think times change. I think he grew up, um, you know, around the same time you grew up, I suppose, Mike, and, and, and some attitudes were different. When you were young, Still at school, were you aware of his status as possibly the world's biggest gambler? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I became aware when I, you know, started going to casinos with him, which was probably around the time, you know, that I was I was finishing high school that he wasn't um, the average punter. I um, I saw some examples of that. It's legendary that his dad gambled big, and James Packer has the same instincts. When he sold the family stake in Channel 9, he bet big on casinos, investing in Australia, the US, and especially China. At the peak of the global financial crisis, when the world shut down, he rolled the dice on the rise of China and the money to be made 
in Macau. A tiny island which is now the gambling capital of the world. Just metres away is mainland China with 1.34 billion people and hundreds of millions of people now in the middle class and looming as a major economic power in the world. Their expenditure in Macau alone is now approaching $1 billion a week. James and fellow billionaire, business partner and friend, Lawrence Ho, commissioned the City of Dreams. And they got an Aussie, Wal King from Leighton's, to build it. And I remember Wal saying to me at, at one stage when we were talking about the size of this building, he said, do you want the good news or the bad news? And I said, give me the good news. I always ask for the good news first. Dad always asks for the bad news first. Um, he said, the good news, it's the 10th biggest building in the world, this one that we're in now, 10th biggest building in the world. I said, what's the bad news? He said, it's the smallest building on the street. They are big buildings. They are big buildings. This is about 8 million square feet. Crown's the biggest building in Australia, if we include all of the hotels and the, the towers. It's about 6 million square feet. So this is, you know, 33% bigger than that. Parliament House is the second biggest building in Australia. These are big buildings. And, and the building across the road, the Venetian, I think that's the biggest building in the world. It's about 15 million square feet. They're massive. James Packer is now 45. But like all lads with a bit of get up and go, his teenage years were interesting, to say the least. You started, uh, like all young boys, going out with girls, but you were the rich one. <laughs> How did that affect finding girls, girls finding you? I think it helped. <laughs> I'd be shocked if it didn't. I think, I think you know, it's back, to, it's back to your first question. I can, you know, you can look at that and say, well, did they really like you because you were you or did they like you because, you know, you were someone's son and you had money? I'm just going to choose to look at it as a positive and another piece of good fortune that's happened in my life. And, and I think, you know, to, to be more serious about it, um, I think, uh, you know, I've, I've got the most wonderful wife um, and I've been lucky with the women in my life that, you know, they... And you have three beautiful children. Three beautiful children, and I've got a wonderful sister and a wonderful mother, and so um, all, all of those things are a long time ago. At, at what stage did you realise there was a certain type of girl or woman <laughs> that you thought was good for you? Was it just the most beautiful? No, no I, think, I think that... Uh, um, it's very hard to know why sometimes there are butterflies in your stomach and um, it's uh, always more than um, just the way someone looks. It's the chemistry that people have when they're together for whatever reason, whether their sense of humour's uh, match and, and, and work together, whether or not they've got at a soul level a connection. I mean, wh why people get on um, is one of those wonderful mysteries of life. Then you matured to the stage where your dad allowed you to make some business decisions. <laughs> yeah. Here's the tough stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Because you had a terrible start. One teller, you lost. Yeah. 380 million, something like that. There's no doubt that you know uh, one tell was a was a terrible um, was a terrible uh, investment and uh, and something that I regret greatly. We did some other things at that time as well in um, you know which I think I had a fair bit to do with uh, in terms of buying you know Crown Casino yeah, and, I, and getting sorry I, I want to get to that. Well, that was at the same time, so I'm just pushing back a little bit, maybe we didn't defensively. Read, we didn't read that at the time. The I media think, was I think, pretty no, harsh I, I, on I, you I, and I, the I, gossip was pretty harsh on you. I think that uh, Fairfax in particular went very hard at me over one tell. And um, you can understand that. It was a lot of money and, um, and, and um, I was leading it and, and, um, and the Murdochs were investors as well at my behest and so I felt um, 
uh, a large degree of responsibility for, for, for the fact that it was uh, a failure for them as well. And, and I will, um, till the day I die, respect and appreciate the way both Lachlan and Rupert uh, were as kind to me as they were. What did your dad have to say? You know, it was... It, I, Yeah, he, he said a bunch of things, which is what, which is why I'm pausing. I mean, there were, there were moments that he was very supportive, and you know, there were moments that he said, you know, I, I hope you learn from this, and there were moments he said, I told you so, and there were, there were probably moments when the temper that you referred to previously came out. So there was, you know, there, there was there was a full range of, of, um, of emotions from from Dad. Would it be fair to say that you then went into personally a downward spiral with other things going wrong and... I think that would be fair. Marriage breakup, uh, putting on weight. That would be fair. Would you say you were a recluse? Um, I, I, in Sydney I certainly was. Yeah. What happened to you? I think, you know, I was... Um, I, I became depressed and I uh, was uh, emotionally uh, exhausted and uh, my marriage had broken up. I felt isolated. Uh, I felt like a failure. Um, you know, I was, it, was, it was not a great time in my life. And sometimes, you know, sometimes you need time and sometimes you need some new influences in your life and, um, and um, you know, that was, that's, that's what happened to me at that point. Is that when you went into Scientology? Well, I, it, it was something very strange happened to me. I think, um, uh, you know, when things go badly in life, I, I remember thinking this at the time and it's still true, I think I remember thinking that you can categorise people into sort of three areas. People who you expect to be there for you and who are. People who expect you expect to be there for you and who aren't, and then people who you don't expect to be there for you and who are. And, um, and in that last category, um, when I was at uh, my lows, um, Tom Cruise reached out to me and it was, a, it was a surreal thing. I'd met him once or twice, only once or twice, and, uh, and he was in Australia and we got together and I think he could tell that I was in pain and he could tell us, and he invited me to his house for, to, to go skiing with him uh, at Christmas, uh, probably in Christmas 2001. So six months after one tell went broke and we spent a couple of weeks together and, um, and subsequently he, um, he was uh, just an amazing friend to me. And I, you know, on Boxing Day every year, I'd go and spend 10 days with him and see him through the year and he'd never asked me for anything. He's never asked me for anything in, in our entire life. And uh, he believed in me when, when other people didn't. I think, you know, I'm very grateful. And yet you didn't have any great background as friends? Um, no. Why do you think he did it? I'm, I'm the wrong person to ask. I just think he's a very special person. Now, I don't want to go into Scientology because this is not the interview to be sure. investigating religions um and you and you and i've both done a bit of investigation in our times yeah but even with the help of tom cruise it indicates to me that you were seeking something you were searching for something do you know what it was when you're as lucky as i am you have to be very careful uh how uh I, I'm, I'm going to try and be very careful how I say this because I, I preface it by saying I realise I am so lucky. But I think happiness is the most important thing in life. And um, uh, it sounds very self-indulgent when a rich man talks about happy, you know, the search for happiness because uh, 
as I said before, I, I recognise the vast majority of people would swap places with me and I wouldn't swap places with, with anyone. So, um, but, but I think, I think happiness is the, is the thing that's, that we're all striving for in life. And the mind is a funny thing. And, you know, why the mind sometimes makes people happy and sometimes unhappy is, is, is one of the big questions of life. What James Packer clearly takes pleasure from is his work. Mike, welcome to Crown the Cow. Thanks, mate. It's great to thank you for making the effort to come up. I yeah, appreciate it. It's really interesting. He's a bloke thriving on the business he's in. When he joined up with Lawrence Ho, they both had money, but both were struggling to make their own mark. But we're actually competing against Lawrence's father. Uh, Lawrence is competing against his father. For a <laughs> both their fathers, Kerry Packer, and Stanley Ho, larger than life. Would you have ever competed with your father? I'm not as brave as Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think both point. James and I have such legendary fathers that you know we both want to really step out of the shadow. Well, James has been a phenomenal partner, and um, you know, like a like a marriage, you know, we've gone through you know tough days, and that's why you know we. You know, we, we appreciate the, the, the good days even more. What don't you like about him? <laughs> well, he's a foot taller than me. <laughs> you know, that for one thing. Um, <laughs> no, but he, he's a great guy. He's a great guy. James, your turn. I think, um, no, I, I like Lawrence being a foot shorter than me. That works <laughs> for me. Um, no, as Lawrence said, it's, uh, you know, Lawrence and I have got a special friendship and a special relationship. It's, uh, you know, we both... Uh, have uh, legendary fathers, and it's great fun to have started out on this dream together. And you know, there've been some interesting moments through that period of time, the global financial crisis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. When when this town actually shut down, um, we were the only people who kept on building, mm -hmm. um, and it was scary because you know money was tight. Um, but as you sit here now, eight and a half years later, and having been through some of those tough times and got to the other side of it and knowing that both of us during the tough times behaved well towards each other. You know, we've got a proper relationship that's been tested and, and may the good times last. Kerry Francis, Bullmore Packer. I, I appear here this afternoon reluctantly. Well, let's jump back to your dad, who's one of the most interesting characters any of us have ever met. Now, of course I am minimising my tax, and if anybody in this country doesn't minimise their tax, they want their heads rent. Because as a, as a government, I can tell you, you're not spending it that well that we should be donating extra. You were with him when you saw him gambling big. Yeah. Did you ever understand that? I did, actually. I think, and I think I understand it more now than I did at the time. I think that... Um, especially in his, in his later years when, when his health wasn't great. Um, I think it was one of those things that gave him an adrenaline rush and, you know, it gave him excitement and made him feel alive. Was he happy? He's certainly happy a couple of times at the casinos when he had a few wins that I was with him. He seemed very happy, <laughs> maybe the happiest I've seen him. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure if you're talking about specific instances or more generally, and, and I think, to, to give, a, to give a, a more serious answer to, it, to, to the question, it's not yes or no. I think there were moments in my dad's life when he was very happy and there were moments in my dad's life when he was very unhappy. He's, uh, you know, he was a mercurial person and, um, you know, and he, was, uh, he had big mood swings. Would you say he had demons? I think we all have demons, Mike, and I think that um, I think he um, he had he had his share. What have you learned from that? I think that it's much easier now to, um, to 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 say what do I have to do as a person to give myself the highest chance of being happy and to give myself the highest chance of extinguishing my demons. There's a uh, generational change that's made that more um, acceptable to, to, to do and to pursue. I remember um, 
vaguely, not specifically, um, you know, uh, someone talking about happiness with Dad once. You know, this would have been probably 20 or 30 years ago. And it, he, looked as, he looked back at this person as though they were speaking a foreign language. I think, you know, when you grew up, you know, at the... In the, in the 50s and the 60s, um, I think that that was probably a soft subject and real men didn't go near soft subjects. Well, there was one quote, for example, where you allegedly said to, uh, I think, Mr Parrish, or maybe even the full board, there's a little bit of whore in all of us. Mm -hmm. Is that subtle? No, but I've never pretended to be subtle, Mike. But I, do you want the background to why that remark came out? I mean, is that of interest to you or do you just want to get the nasty remark in? My father had a very lonely childhood and he didn't have a great, good relationship with his father. And, and I think there are lots of examples in life when the dominant emotional relationships in your life are with a parent and that relationship isn't a good one, where that leaves lasting scars. And I think that that was, um, uh, you know, I think that was clearly the case with, with my father and his father. One of the true joys of my life is that, uh, is that my father and I ended in a, um, in a perfect spot. And um, one of the, my last, my last conversation with my father was a sort of, was, was, was an amazing, uh, was an amazing experience as I look back on it. And I didn't realise it was going to be my last conversation with him. And, um, and uh, it was at the end of 2005 and Dad had been sick probably for, you know, 10 or 15 years before that and on many occasions, you know, we'd spoken about, you know, the fact that he thought that he could be in real trouble and he could be about to die and had those conversations. And, and at the end of 2005 he, you know, wasn't well but there was not a sense that he was about to die. And um, I was on holidays, it was Christmas time, and, uh, and, and the phone rang and I was, I was overseas, uh, you know, sort of 24 hours from Sydney, and, um, and it was Dad, and I wasn't expecting a call, and so I, you know, I always got a bit jumpy when Dad called, you know, I didn't know it was going to be a good call or a bad call. And it was a beautiful call, it was for about, for about an hour, and the and it was a strange call and I look back on it now and obviously understand what it was but you know it was a call he said he loved me and he said he was proud of me and he said uh, were they new words no but it was a it was a different phone call and he said that uh, he said that he said that he wants he wanted me to know that you know you know, if anything ever happened to him, he wanted me to live my life my way and never think about what he would have done or what would, a, would he want me to do. And so it was a strange call. And anyway, um, so it was a lovely call. And uh, so I put down the phone. Uh, 24 hours later, his doctor rang and said, get on the plane. He's got 24 hours to live. And I got home and held his hand and he passed. And um, Dad knew that he didn't tell me. But he, he was a fucking big man, Mike. He was a big man. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. You're proud of him? I think that's pretty cool. But was that one hour worth? <sighs> wasn't worth doing this fucking interview, I'll tell you. <laughs>